Hello, U.S. History class, and welcome to my first lecture um, for this class. Um, since we've gone on the, our coronavirus break, um, which it's kind of looking like it's going to last longer uh, than we thought. I um, hope you all are staying safe. I hope you all are doing your NTI work which it doesn't look like all of you have done it yet. So um, still plenty of time left, but I do need to get those, you know, relatively as soon as possible. So keep that in mind. Um, make sure you're doing your NTI work. Uh, also, I've been instructed that some of you are going to be on my call list that I will be contacting uh, on a weekly basis just to check in see how things are going with you um, and uh, make sure you're doing your NTI work make sure that you're not failing um, you know that kind of stuff uh, we are getting close to the end of the year and like I said we may be meeting like this for a while so um, it's just you know we're kind of basically turning this into an online class it wasn't really built to be an online class but we do have you know the tools necessary to kind of make it happen um, so anyway, I wanted to post the lecture on here just to kind of explain some things that you may be uh, coming up on, some things that, uh, to get ready for your exam, um, because we're probably going to end up having to do this exam, uh, on Converge, um, or maybe not, if it's not on Converge, just digitally, um, in general. Um, so I did want to take the opportunity and go over the early Cold War, because this unit really technically ends, uh, at the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we're not going to get to Vietnam. Um, and the civil rights movement until the next unit. So I wanted to make sure we didn't get too far ahead of ourselves, but you know we are coming up you know pretty close to the end of the unit already. Um, so um, and without further ado, we'll get right into talking about the early Cold War uh, from the atomic bomb to the Cuban Missile Crisis, and that's where your work, your NTI work, is going to end at uh, is with the Cuban Missile Crisis. So. Um, We'll start off talking about the finishing up World War II. Um, in June of 1945, Great Britain, the U.S., and the Soviet Union all began uh, dividing up sections of Berlin for occupation. Um, Germany had already surrendered. Adolf Hitler is off the scene. Um, it's been a couple months, really, since VE Day, which is Victory in Europe Day. Um, and, you know, the Allied nations were not really in agreement about how post-war Germany was going to be run. Um, you know, the Allied powers really didn't want to punish Germany too severely for, you know, what Adolf Hitler had done, uh, mostly because they remembered the lessons from World War I and the Treaty of Versailles and how that ended up. Um, on the other hand, Joseph Stalin was not in the same agreement. Um, he wanted to punish uh, Germany very severely for what had happened. Um, and he also didn't really want to let go of the territory that the Soviet Union had conquered um, towards the end of World War II. Um, so that was going to cause a lot of problems as well. Uh, the countries met at, at a conference called the Potsdam Conference um, in 1945 to decide how to deal with post-war Europe. Mind you, at the same time, the war with Japan is still going on. Um, and the Soviet Union had just recently gotten into the war uh, with Japan, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, because the Soviet Union is actually very close to Japan and Japan Japanese-occupied territory, but they had not been fighting against Japan because they had pretty much put all the resources against Germany. Um, on August 6th and August 9th, the U.S. drops two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, which effectively ends, ends the war. Um, but it really is kind of also the beginning of the Cold War because now you have these two superpowers, um, the Soviet Union and the United States. The Soviet Union, um, most people believe, had the most powerful army um, and you know of all these tanks and, and planes. Um, and the U.S. now, though, has the atomic weapon, which is the ultimate equalizer. Um, Japan eventually surrenders. Uh, the Korean Peninsula gets split along the 38th parallel. Actually, the 38th parallel, everything above the, the 38th parallel, all the Japanese soldiers there uh, surrender to the Soviet Union. Uh, below that, everyone surrenders to the United States, um, which didn't seem like a huge deal at the time, but it's ultimately going to be... Um, an extremely big deal and, and one that we still, the consequences of which we still deal with today. Um, because, 
the obviously North and South Korea exist today, and obviously we have a lot of problems with North Korea even you know to this day for certain reasons that we'll get into. Uh, let me move myself over here. I'm just gonna put myself right in front of Winston Churchill, or I'll put my, here I am watching Winston Churchill from the side. Um, in 1946, uh, Winston Churchill went on a tour of the United States. He actually gets voted out of office uh, in Britain. Um, he's not really that popular. Um, he's actually a lot more popular in the United States than he is uh, in Great Britain after the war um, because he's a really conservative dude um, and he just doesn't really fit in well with with British politics. He was good for a time of crisis, but for the most part, people there just are not really huge fans of him. Uh, but anyway, he tours the United States, uh, and on March 5th, 1946, he delivers what he what is called today the Iron Curtain speech, uh, which is important because it's going to have an inf- it's going to have an impact um, on U.S. foreign policy and dealing uh, with the Soviet Union. Up until this point, there's really a pretty big divide about how to handle. Soviet Union, you have people, you know, on the far right, like uh, General Patton calling for the U.S. to invade um, the Soviet Union. Most rational thinking people aren't really thinking in those terms. Uh, but anyway, that uh, Churchill gives his Iron Iron Curtain speech. Here's just an excerpt from it. This is probably the most uh, uh, famous aspect. He says, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic. An iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. And really what he's talking about is just the edge of communism. Um, And that everything behind that is behind this iron curtain where they're running things basically, uh, you know, much different than in the West, in the capitalist uh, places and, and democracies. Um, just the whole Western idea um, is being lost behind this this Iron Curtain. And he views that as a very negative thing, as do most people uh, in the West at that time. Uh, but for him, it's a real negative thing. And that leads us to the implementation of two things, uh, the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan. Um, and we've talked about these already. We talked about these in class, and we were able to meet in person. Uh, but in 1947, President Truman began implementing a policy of containment. Um, and basically, just this whole idea is just that the, the U.S. is going to work to keep communism where it is and keep it from spreading. Basically, there's this whole domino theory that uh, if one country falls, then another country and another country, then another country will keep falling to communism. So they want to keep uh, communism from spreading. And initially, it, it starts with the U.S. sending aid to Greece, which is at the time in the middle of the civil war between um, these monarchists who were propped up by the British government and this new communist faction in Greece, which you don't need to know all that, but that's basically what's happening. Um, and just a month later, uh, George C. Marshall um, introduces what's called the Marshall Plan, which we've also talked about, um, which is kind of a similar idea to containment, except it's just mainly pointed at Western uh, Europe and rebuilding efforts of Western Europe in order to prevent uh, Western European nations from falling to communism because Marshall knows, uh, as well as Truman, that uh, a lot of these countries are succumbing to communism because they're too weak to defend themselves. They've been too battered from the war, so they're not really able to to put up a defense. Um, and so the U.S. has to get involved uh, financially as well as, as uh, humanitarian aid uh, to these places to rebuild them so they're strong enough to stand on their own, but also um, they don't have to look for the for the Soviet Union to come and help them because the United States is already helping them. So here's just a, a map um, with some of the money that was sent from the United States to um, these European nations. You'll see uh, some money spent in Austria, a lot of money spent in Italy and West Germany because uh, after the war, the Germany gets split into East and West Germany. East Germany falls into the Soviet sphere of influence. Uh, Western Germany falls under the, the uh, influence of the United States and, the, and Great Britain. Uh, but you'll notice most of the money spent in France and the UK, but some money spent uh, in Belgium, Luxembourg, uh, Switzerland, um, the Netherlands, some spent in Denmark, um, a little money spent in Norway, Sweden, and Turkey, uh, as well as a little bit in Portugal. But ultimately, they're just trying to help 
Um, these nations ultimately are going to spend about $13 billion, um, which wouldn't be a lot of money today, but back in, in those days, it's quite a substantial amount of funds. And that was just in a four year uh, period. But ultimately, most of these countries do rebuild uh, and, and become very westernized, and they become uh, members of something called NATO, um, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, there's another important event that we didn't really get into too much uh, when we were meeting, uh, but it's the building of the Berlin Wall and the airlift. So we talked uh, earlier just a few minutes ago about the issue with uh, Berlin um, and the U.S. and the Soviet Union not really agreeing on how Germany is going to be split up or what's going to happen in Germany after the war. Uh, they split Berlin up into different sections. Uh, basically, you have an East and West Berlin, kind of like you have an East and West Germany. Um, on April the 1st, 1948, the Soviet Union starts constructing uh, the Berlin Wall. Um, they basically have had enough. Um, you know, the, the U.S. is trying to kind of undermine the Soviet effort in East Berlin, um, they're trying to convince people in East Berlin to come to the West Berlin uh, or basically overthrow the Soviet Union, in a sense. Um, and so they start building this wall to build, to uh, create this separation. Uh, and then the Soviets also start blockading roads and railroads into West Berlin. Um, and it starts something that's known as the Berlin Airlift, which goes on for 11 months. For 11 months, the U.S. government, um, in conjunction with the U.N. and NATO, um, actually fly supplies into West Berlin uh, at an astronomical rate. Um, you know, before it, it was thought the only way that you could really, you know, supply a city that large uh, for that length of time was with having railroads um, and being able to use the roads, but they're not able to, so they use airplanes, and the airplanes were so efficient that I can't, can't remember exactly what the total was. I think there was a plane touching down uh, at the Berlin airport every two and a half minutes, something like that, something crazy. Um, it was a really uh, large feat, and but the blockade would stay in effect for the next 11 months. And finally, um, after so much time had passed, the Soviet Union uh, finally decided to lift those blockades so the railroads were running again into West Berlin. But it was a pretty tense moment, probably the first real tense um, issue between the United States and the Soviet Union post-war. Um, not that there hadn't been some already, but this is the this is the real tipping point. And it's not very long after this that, that the Soviet Union develops their first nuclear weapon, and that starts to ratchet things up. Um, so then you have uh, NATO versus the Warsaw Pact. So these countries in Europe are going to fall into one of two groups. They're either going to be in NATO or the Warsaw Pact. Now, there are nations who are not aligned um, for various reasons. Yugoslavia, for example, actually becomes a communist nation, but they don't really like the Soviet Union getting involved so much in um, their business. So the Comintern, which is the, the central, which is basically the, the committee that runs the Soviet Union, um, actually kicks Yugoslavia out, um, even though they're a communist nation. So not all communists get along. Um, but you'll notice that this actually extends into Turkey. Turkey falls under the NATO uh, agreement. Uh, Greece, Italy, West Germany, Denmark, the United Kingdom, Belgium, Netherlands, France, so on and so forth, Western European nations usually, although Turkey is kind of an exception. Um, but then the, in the Soviet Union, falls the, uh, these nations fall under the, the Warsaw Pact. Although they're technically independent nations, most of their dictators are propped up by uh, Stalin. Um, they're not all dictators, but for the most part, they're all going to be communist nations. Um, you know, anytime there's a rebellion to try to overthrow uh, communist rule, uh, the Soviet Union is going to send troops in and squash them. There's going to be several rebellions that actually happened between the, in the 50s and 60s. Um, you know, we would have covered that in your world history class. We're not going to talk about that too much today, but um, that's you know, generally what's happening. And I'm not going to say that, that everybody is upset who's living in these areas, but it's really not a great place uh, to live. So the first major war that breaks out um, is the Korean War. And, you know, the common theme here is that the Soviet Union gets the most of the, the wrath of the United States government or the, most of the focus about all these things that are happening in the world, but it's really China um, who's behind most of this. The Chinese, and we'll talk more about them in a second, but they are really the ones who are actually supporting these efforts for some of these countries in Asia to become communist. 
uh, and the Soviet Union really doesn't have as much to do with it. Um, they are not really in the imperial game. Um, they kind of get that way in the 70s and 80s when they, they try to take over Afghanistan and a few other countries, but they're pretty happy with where they're at. Uh, most of their focus is towards Europe. They're not really focused too much on Korea, and a lot of that has to do with kind of racial tendencies. Um, but anyway, uh, September 1948, uh, communist forces actually seized control of North Korea. Um, and just a couple of months later, the United Nations recognizes South Korea as a democratic country um, and, and officially recognizes their government as a nation, which is, is kind of a weird way that countries come into being. Um, but then just two years later, North Korea invades South Korea um, in 1950 to try to unite the entire peninsula. And there's going to be like finger pointing on who actually starts this. Most historians believe it's North Korea who does invade South Korea. So that's kind of where I would fall on that. If, if you see a question about that, North Korea is the aggressor nation in, this, in those regards. Um so following the containment policy, which, again, we talked about, that was that was the policy of, of Harry Truman, who's still the president at this time. Uh, General Douglas MacArthur, hero of World War II, um, orders the U.S. Army into Korea. And at this point, the situation is really dire for the South Koreans. Uh, the North Koreans had pushed all the way into the tiny a tiny pocket in southeastern uh, South Korea. Uh, but the U.S. and U.N. forces um, come in, uh, and they push the North Koreans back. I mean, they really push them back. They push them back almost all the way into China. Um, they take back the uh, Seoul, which is the capital city of, of South Korea. Um, but as the situation starts to look really bleak for the North Koreans, all of a sudden, uh, the Chinese, again, like we just mentioned, uh, they start sending soldiers over the border, um, not, in a, not in an official capacity. They're technically volunteers who are going on their own behest. The Chinese government is not officially involved. Um, but the Chinese, um, most of these people are Chinese, and we're talking hundreds of thousands of soldiers who are, who are crossing the border. Um, this, creates a, this creates conflict between uh, Douglas MacArthur and Harry Truman. One of the lessons that we did before we left was the, was, um, uh, the firing of Douglas MacArthur. Douglas MacArthur wants to use atomic bombs on China and North Korea. Uh, he wants to go to war with China. Harry Truman does not agree with that stance. Um, and so he ends up removing Douglas MacArthur because MacArthur tries to go around uh, Harry Truman to get his way. Uh, Truman figures it out um, and sends him back. Um, eventually, uh, the war is going to end in stalemate, uh, back to the same border that they had before, the 38th parallel. Um, there will be a demilitarized zone um, that will be in effect um, between both borders. Uh, it's a couple miles wide. Um, and it'll it'll remain stalemate. It's still there today. That's where the, the line is even still today. Um, I think they have finally officially ended the war. Uh, there had been an armistice or like a ceasefire agreement uh, that had been in place for a long time, um, but um, I'm not even really sure. I'd have to go back and look and see if they had actually if they've actually officially ended it. I know they they were having some friendly talks. Uh, between the South Korean government and the North Korean government because the South Koreans weren't very happy um, with the way the United States has been handling their relationship with North Korea recently. So anyway, I digress. Um, so what was the Cold War like in the United States during this time? Well, um, it's a pretty paranoid time uh, to be an American. Um, on July 7th, 1949, this fellow named Alger Hiss uh, who was a suspected communist spy, uh, went to trial um, for being a, a alleged communist spy. And he'll eventually be convicted of hiding um, his um, uh, basically membership to a communist party, a non-U.S. Uh, communist party. Uh, but basically he's treated like a spy. Um, and that sets off a period that's known as the Second Red Scare. The First Red Scare happens uh, at the end of World War One, and we talked about the Palmer Raids. Um, and some of the other, uh, the, Van, the Vanzetti trial uh, that happens um, uh, because of all these Eastern Europeans who are moving um, to the U.S. after World War I. Uh, so this is technically the second Red Scare, but most people, if you, if, they, if you talk about the Red Scare, this is what they're talking about. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Joe McCarthy, uh, who's a senator, who says he has the names of over 205 communists who are working in the U.S. government at that time. 
and it sets off panic. Um, he sets up the, he sets up a, a commission uh, to investigate some of these people. Um, no one, there's not really a lot of people who actually get tried for it. It really just, just, it just kind of creates a lot of hysteria. Um, nothing really much comes of it. Uh, finally, eventually in 1954, the, the U.S. Senate will actually vote to censure uh, McCarthy, which basically means to kind of scold him um, and kind of keep him from talking anymore because, you know, they basically find out that he was just full of a lot of of, of bluff and didn't really have anything concrete. Um, so it doesn't really end well for McCarthy, basically, in a nutshell. Here's some of uh, uh, some um, political cartoons, um, basically kind of making fun of of McCarthy in general. This first one, you know, he's got doctored photos and fake letters um, of uh, people that he claimed were communists, who you know ultimately get proven not to be communists. Um, and then you know, like one of the, he picked these. Basically, they're kind of making fun of of um, McCarthy for saying how many communists he had, and, and he says, "Why did you pick 17? And uh, the other guy that he's with says, "Oh, I just did what you did. Pick the first number that popped into my head." Um, and then you have McCarthy doing the speech, and these guys are coming in with this fence, um, and on the back it says, uh, "Post no bills," um, and Joe. Uh, Zitch is a red, um, you know, basically, you know, kind of making fun of McCarthy, saying he doesn't really have a strategy. Uh, he doesn't really have any evidence. He's just gaining a lot of attention, um, preying on people's fear of communism at this point. So McCarthy is a big one. I definitely make sure that you study up on McCarthy for any tests that we have. Um, the Cold War in China. There's just a couple of... Um, points here, but um, I think it's important to know um, the Chinese CCP um, comes into power. They are not really affiliated with the common turn in the Soviet Union. Um, there's a common misconception among a lot of Americans and a lot of people in general that the communist state all work together. Now, it's true that the Soviet Union and China have friendly relations for the most part, but to say that they work together um, not really. The CCP pretty much does what it wants. Um, and for most of the 30s and 40s, they are involved in a uh, fight or die um, war with uh, a nationalist party in China, basically a civil war, um, a Chinese civil war between uh, this group known the, as the Kuomintang, um, who are led by this guy named Chiang Kai-shek. Um, and they're fighting against the CCP um, and they almost destroy the CCP. Um, and the CCP looks for Moscow to come in and help them. And Moscow says, we'd rather not. Um, and so they really don't have a great relationship with the common term uh, in Moscow. And there'll be plenty of times throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s where they just don't get along very well. Um, which, you know, that's something that the United States is, doesn't really seem to be aware of or doesn't really seem to care. Um, either way, finally, in 1949... Um, the Chinese Civil War finally ends. Mao Zedong, the guy here in the picture on the left, um, whose face I'm kind of blocking. There you go. Maybe you can see him a little better now. I'll, here, I'll, I'll go over the soldier. Here I am. Um, so um, Mao finally wins. Uh, they finally defeat uh, the Kuomintang. Um, and force Chiang Kai-shek to flee to Taiwan. Um, this is actually going to be Part of the reason why there's still a Taiwan today, uh, separate from China, uh, not officially a Chinese state, because the people who settled there are from the Nationalist Chinese Party, and they kind of view themselves as China. Um, and there will be a lot of issues with the United States foreign policy uh, from this point forward, basically trying to tiptoe around whether you call Taiwan Taiwan, whether you call them China, whether there's a two Chinese state or just one Chinese state. Um, causes a lot of issues. Anyway, um, the Chinese Communist Party assists North Korea against the UN. The, the Soviet Union does not really have much to do with North Korea. Um, why it's a part of the Cold War, um, you have to really understand that communism is more than just 
the Soviet Union, that it's actually a fight against just spreading communism everywhere, whether the Soviet Union has anything to do with it or not. Now, the, the Soviet Union is fine with North Korea being communist. They support them in that regard, but they're not really sending soldiers or really any money. Uh, they, may fi- they may send a few supplies, but they're not really that heavily involved in North Korea. And they're not going to be very heavily involved in Vietnam when we get to Vietnam. It's really going to be the Chinese again. It's the Chinese who have most to do with, with Asia. Um, now, there's going to be other parts of the world where the Soviet Union is going to have a bigger impact, and, and we'll, we'll talk about Cuba here in a second. But for the most part in Asia, it's going to be the Chinese who have uh, the most to do with anything that's going on in terms of the spread of communism. So Cuba. Um, a little background on Cuba very quickly. Um, you know, the United States... Um, you know, we talked about the, the Spanish-American War. The United States had freed uh, Cuba from uh, the Spanish rule um, in 1898. Um, and for the most part, the U.S. had kind of ruled Cuba as a, a protectorate state where they basically had control of Cuba but not complete control. And another civil war breaks out in Cuba in the 1950s with the rebels led by this guy named Fidel Castro, um, who becomes very important. Um, in the story very quickly. Um, And in 1959, Fidel Castro successfully takes over the Cuban government. Um, Initially, he was supported somewhat by um, the the U.S. Um, They thought that the best chance for unifying Cuba was by having Fidel Castro win. And initially, they have pretty good relations um, when he first takes office. But it's not very long before people realize that he has a lot of socialist communist tendencies uh, and the U.S. doesn't like it and they try to overthrow him um, and they actually they actually send soldiers in uh, in something called the Bay of Pigs incident in the John F. Kennedy administration um, and it's a disaster. Um, the The U.S. troops get killed. Um, they they don't really know what they're what they're doing. They go they they go to the the Bay of Pigs, which is apparently you know not a great place to go. Uh, they get trapped by the Cuban army, and most of them are uh, murdered. Um, so relations with the United States don't, they kind of sour. Um, so Castro, you know, turns to the Soviet Union. He has a lot of communist tendencies. The Soviet Union has a bone to pick with the United States, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Um, and the Soviet Union realizes they have an opportunity to build a missile site on Cuba, which is just 70 miles off the coast of Florida. Um, and so they, they start working on, on building a nuclear missile site there in Cuba, um, you know, very close to the United States. And this sends the world into a panic, um, as you might imagine. Here's a, here's a political cartoon just kind of demonstrating how close all of a sudden um, all these American cities are to a nuclear bomb uh, being launched at them. It's just 234 miles to Miami, 751 to Atlanta. That sounds like a lot if you're driving, but you know, you know, if you were able to actually launch a missile that far, which they are, they do have the capability to at this point. Um, it's really not that far. So, uh, following the discovery of the site on Cuba, John F. Kennedy announces it to the public, and this sends the first real panic um, of the Cold War through the American people. Um, you know, up until this point, people are, were already having, um, you know. Uh, basically drills to to prepare for a a nuclear bomb explosion uh but nobody really it doesn't really seem it still didn't really seem that real to people yet um but the cuban missile crisis made it made it real because they realized that uh the soviet union was able to put a a nuclear missile that close to the united states um so the u.s begins basically bracing for a nuclear war with the soviet union sets off this this period of a few days um where Tensions between the U.S. and uh, Soviet Union get really tense. Um, actually, Kennedy and Khrushchev, who's the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, um, they have a they have this special bat phone, uh, this red phone that they has a has a, a protected line between just the U.S. and the Soviet Union that just they use, just the president and um, the leader of, of the Soviet Union, and. They're communicating back and forth um, using that phone, and um, 
things get really, really tense. The U.S. government puts a blockade. Uh, the Navy uh, puts a blockade around Cuba because they don't, although they're building the missile site, they don't have the nuclear bomb there yet. Um, but while they're shipping the nuclear bomb, the U.S. government puts this uh, blockade around uh, Cuba, and there's this really tense moment where the the Soviet Union Navy is is going uh, full steam ahead, trying to get to Cuba. Uh, and there's this point where it's it's you know are they going to fire at each other, or is there going to be a war starting right here, right now? Um, and John F. Kennedy holds his ground. Khrushchev blinks, uh, and Khrushchev turns the ships around at the last second. Um, and that. That puts an end, kind of, to the Soviet, um, to the to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, eventually, just a couple of weeks later, uh, Kennedy will agree to meet uh, with Khrushchev in in West in uh, West Berlin. Uh, so he travels to West Berlin, meets with Khrushchev, um, and they come. They eventually come to a nuclear arms treaty, which is the first that they'd actually signed to kind of reduce um, uh, nuclear arms between the two or at least reduce the production. Um, there will be a lot more treaties um, once you get to the, the Nixon administration uh, and then eventually the Reagan administration. Um, but this is kind of the big, the first time that they they actually come to an agreement on uh, how they can regulate, um, you know, the issues between the two sides. Um, so the Cuba, um, I said Cuba removes missile site from Cuba. Uh, Soviet Union removes their, their missile site from Cuba, um, and the U.S. Uh, agrees to remove the missile site from Turkey, um, which is something I didn't mention. You actually are going to have to do an assignment um, on the Cuban Missile Crisis, probably next week for most of you. Um, the U.S. had actually been been storing um, and had a missile site of their own in Turkey. Remember, Turkey is a member of NATO, um, and it's very close to the Soviet Union, and they had had missiles. They had had actual nuclear missiles pointed at the Soviet Union. Now, that gets skipped a lot when you talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis because, you know, the Soviet Union trying to put, you know, uh, nuclear missiles in Cuba is basically no different than the U.S. having them in Turkey. The only difference is that as Americans, we don't trust the Soviets. Well, the Soviets didn't trust the Americans. Um, So you can see, you know, why they might have been upset uh, in the first place. So the U.S. agrees to remove those missiles, um, and that kind of puts an end to the Cuban Missile Crisis. So that's pretty much all I got for you guys today. Um, Remember to make sure you're doing your NTI work. It's important. Um, Like I said, we may be meeting like this for a while, so all the work that you have for not just my class but for other classes is probably going to be NTI work for the foreseeable future. Um, nothing's been announced. Um, you know, as of now, we're still scheduled to have school on August or on April the 6th. Um, hopefully we get to meet back on April the 6th. Um, but it's not a guarantee. Um, and in fact, we're already preparing for, um, NTI assignments to, to go longer. Actually, the, the Kentucky state house actually just today, um, passed the law which basically gave uh, sc- the school systems unlimited NTI days. Now that has to go through the Senate and then signed by the governor and I don't know when that, if that'll happen. Um, but I mean that's just to kind of give you an idea of where we may be headed. So uh, don't go starting rumors that Mr. Woodcock said this or that. You know like I said you know we're preparing to go to school back on April the 6th until we're told otherwise but I'm just saying it's possible we're going to be told otherwise. So Anyway, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, email me at bradley.woodcock uh, at wayne.kyschools.us. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. Um, but until then, um, make sure you're still doing your NTI packets. Uh, and I hope everybody's staying safe. Um, and sir, we're hoping to do your NTI work. I know, like I said, we still haven't turned yours in. Um, just get those to me as soon as you can. Um, I'm going to keep counting off every day that you don't have them in, just kind of as a reminder to you that you, you know, need to turn them in. So anyway, that's all I got for today. See you guys later.